Hey, and welcome to another edition of Cracking the Cryptic. Um, today, we're going to have a look at a classic Sudoku. Um, and this has been sent in, and I'm, I'm a bit of a sucker for strange shapes in the grid. It's sort of a D and a P in this one. So um, I don't know if these are the initials of the compiler. don't know what the provenance of the puzzle is, but I thought we'd have a go at it and see how we go. So without further ado, and just to say, if you want to have a go at the puzzle, do... Um, uh, do click on the link under the video that will take you to our software and you can have a go at it. Um, our app, Sandwich Sudoku app, is quite close to launch now. If you search for it on Steam, uh, Steam Cracking the Cryptic, you can see a bit of a trailer for that. So uh, lots of things going on in the puzzle world. Anyway, I'm going to try and solve this. Let me concentrate. This must be a two. There we go. We're off and running. Um, there's only one one in the grid, so I'm not going to look at that for very long sevens, these two sevens and this seven mean we can place a seven. These eights mean that we can pencil mark eights. Just a quick reminder, what I recommend is in three by three blocks, if a number can only go in two positions, exactly two positions in the three by three block, then I put pencil mark on the edges of cells using the corner notation. If I pencil mark in the center of cells, then I'm not looking at the box logic, I'm looking at the cell logic and I'm restricting the value of the cell to just the contents. Um, so if I was to pencil mark a you know, 1 and a 2 here, I'd be saying this cell could only be a 1 and a 2. Now, ah, 5s in fact, these 5s also can be pencil marked up into those two squares, but this 5 down here sorts out the order. This must be the 5, and the moment I place the 5 here, because of the logic of the way I'm applying the pencil marks, I've taken one of the two positions the 8s could go in, so that's got to be the 8 now. Let's see if we can put a 5 at the top, and I don't think we can do anything more with 5s. We've got Fives arranged in a cross shape. We don't know anything about fives in the corner boxes yet, but hopefully we will do soon. So threes into these two squares. Um, ah, into a bit of a grinding halt now. Uh, ah, this can be. This can only be an eight. This square here because of the interaction of this 8 and this 8. Sort of floundering around here, trying to spot where the next number might come from. mark three is at the top into those two squares as a result of the three down here and this three over on the left hand side. Eights I suppose I can pencil mark into one of the two squares at the bottom. These two eights here I mean this square must be an eight. Ah okay now another reason for using the pencil mark method I recommend it is not just to find these pairs that we found here but it's to find exactly this sort of situation where look we've got eights in one of these two squares in this box and over on this side of the grid I've got eights in one of these two squares in this box so you can see that these eights are aligned i.e. they are in the same rows of the grid now we can do a bit of logic and think about this so we know the eight in this box is in one of these two squares so let's say it's in this square and clearly the 8 over here will have to be in this square and vice versa if this is an 8 then this would be an 8. Now that means if we look at this box it's just not possible that any of these squares contain an 8. If we try and put an 8 in any of these squares we'll end up with 8 in the same rows in the ex these, ex um, these other two boxes. So we know the 8 in this box must either be in this square or this square. And this 8 here sees that 8, so this must be an 8. Um, now, 
what next? I guess we've got a couple of rows here where we've managed to get five numbers. So let's have a quick look at those. One, three, four, and seven along here. Ah, well, this has got to be a three um, because a three can't go here, here, or here, obviously. Um, and that means this is not a three, this is a three at the top. So there now must be a three in one of those two squares. And we need, this square can't be a four because of the four above it. So there must be a four in one of those two positions, but we don't know much about fours in the grid because there's only one here. So I'm doubtful we'll be able to do too much more. check this column. We need 3, 4, 6 and 9. Ugh, that's not looking good at all. Um, wow, this is... I can pencil mark 2's here into those two squares. So this is getting tricky. Uh, and I'm not seeing any obvious ways of Just going to check this row now. Uh, one, five, six, nine. So this square here can only be a one or a five. This can only be a six or a nine. And this can only be a 1 or a 9. This square can be a lot more things. So, is there anything we can deduce from that? Well, uh, well, one thing is interesting. I talked about the 5s being locked into these these outside boxes. So if we look along this row, the five, I'll colour it, the five can go in this square or this square. That's the only two positions. And coming down to the other two square cells that we or boxes we haven't yet labelled fives into, if we look along this row, where can the five go? Well it can go here. Can't go here because of this five can't go here because of this 5, can't go here because of this 5. So the 5s are locked into this, this purple box, if you like. Now this is called an X-wing, and the reason it's called an X-wing is that if we just look at where the 5s can go, I'll label the 5s in and think about it. We know that the 5s are locked into one of two positions here and one of two positions here. So let's imagine this was a 5. Now if this is a 5, because this can't be a 5 now, this square would have to be a 5. So we always know the 5s lie on the sort of opposite corners of this imaginary rectangle. And so they're either here and here, or here and here. And you can see from the way the cursor's moving, it's this X pattern that gives this X-wing its name. Now what this means, of course, is that we can remove five as a possibility from all of those squares. None of these green squares now could contain a five and we need to think about what that means. Well, I'm not sure. Well, Actually, it might be useful, but not for the reason I was expecting. So, if we look at the bottom row now, we've managed to eliminate 5 from this square and this square. But this 5 here is also removing 5 from those two squares. And this 5 is removing a 5 from this square too. So in the bottom row, the 5 is going to be either here 
or here. I don't know which of those it's going to be in, but it will be in one of those positions. Now, that is interesting, isn't it? Because now, I think I'm right in saying, I think it's forced, isn't it? Whichever one of these is a 5, the other one must be an 8. Because if, for example, we try and put a 5 in here, the implication of the pencil mark is that we'd have to put an 8 into this square, and therefore the 8 would be forced downwards over on this side of the grid. So we would have a 5-8 pair. Now, the logic works exactly the same way in reverse. If I try and put a 5 in the, to this square, then this would be forced to be an 8. So we actually get a 5-8 pair into those two positions. And what does that mean? Well, one thing it means is that these sixes are now more interesting than they were. So if we look at this box and ask where a six could go, without this logic on, the on knowing this square can only be a five and an eight, we would have said that a six could go in this square, this square, or this square. Three different squares, no pencil marks. But because this one cannot be a six anymore, I actually get to put sixes into those two squares. And that means that one of these two squares must be a six. Oh my god, this is a this is a beautiful puzzle. Look at this six now. So again, we've got got some gorgeous logic here. So it's same it's the same thing as these eights, just slightly more complicated. This six means this square cannot be a six. So I don't know much about where the six can go in this top left three by three box, but I know it's in one of those positions. Now, if we look across here, these positions are interesting because they're obviously in rows one and two. Now, over here in this three by three block, the six is locked in to row one and row two. So I need to put a six somewhere in row three. It can only be here. So that's a six. And well, yeah, okay, and now this 6 sees this square. Combine it with this 6, I can pencil mark 6s into one of those two squares. This is not a 6 anymore. Uh, this is great, because once I therefore place a 6 here, you can see I'm taking one of the corners of the X-wing. So in placing the 6 here, I now know that the 5s must be here and here in, in my X-wing. So I'm actually going to be able to put a 5 into this square and a 5 into this square and I'm guessing that's going to give me a whole load more as well because we've now got 5s this is going to have to be a 5 and I'm presumably going to get the 5 down here as well this is going to be a 5 down here you can see therefore I immediately get the 8 as well I get the 8 down here so all of these interactions are sort of coming to fruition. We've placed all the fives now. I think we've placed all the eights as well. This five here sees this square, which I've century pencil marked as one and five. So this must now be a one. It can no longer be a five. And that means I complete row three with a nine here. Um, now, this 9, there's no 9s in those squares anymore, so there must be a 9 in one of these positions, which means there's a 9 in one of those two positions as well. 1s in this, these two squares, place a 1 at the top and take a position of a 6, so we can immediately do that. Pencil mark 6 is over on the left hand side of the grid. This one removes a one from those squares. There must be a one in one of those two positions as well. In fact, if we look down here, there must be a two in one of these two positions. I've not yet placed a two in the column. So this square, I think, has to be a seven. Sevens now interact. 
that there's all sorts of interactions going on. The challenge often at this stage of a Sudoku is not to miss a simple piece of logic because we've, all, we've got such a flurry of activity in the puzzle that we need to keep careful track of what we have and what we haven't used. This square must be a 2 just to complete the box. This be 2 in one of those two squares. Now this square here must be a 4 or a 9 but we don't know which of those is valid so let's put the 4 and the 9 in. Uh, I'm going to check row 7 where we need a 1, 4 and a 9 there as well. So this square can only be a 1 or a 4 and that marries up look, with the 1 and 4 we've got above it. So we've got 1, 4 pair so this must be a 2, 7 pair to complete the column and there's a 2 here. So that's a 2, that's a 7. These 7's now interact and allow me to pencil mark 7's on the left hand side. This 7 allows me to pencil mark 7's into those two squares. Now if we look down the chutes here you can see none of the sevens quite align in the same way that we managed to find with the uh, whatever it was. I think it was sixes up here and eights down here. So we still need to do some more thinking. Um, well, in fact, I've seen something we can do here. With, there's a one in one of these two squares and that's going to marry up with the 4's, so there's a 1-4 pair here. So that means 2-3-4 and... Oh, sorry, 2-3-6 and 7 into the open positions. We pencil mark the 2's, the 3's interact, this has to be a 3. 3, 2, 7, 6. Box sixes into those two squares. This seven sees this seven. So hopefully now we're on the home straight. I don't think we're going to need what I noticed before. So we'll, we'll come back to that if we do get stuck. Uh, this must be a two. This is a four down here. Remove the two pencil marked. These two squares have got to be one and nine. Can we resolve it yet? I don't think we can. sure I'm missing any number of things here. There's, there's so, many, so many things pencil marked and so much information in the grid. I'm struggling to do this efficiently. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you what I spotted before. Um, this one here, there's, there's not a one in one of those two squares. Therefore in this column, in column four, you can see that the one is limited to this square or this square. Now the interesting thing I thought about this and is that it marries up exactly with where the ones are appearing in column 8, those two squares. So again I'll use a different colour. We've got this arrangement of ones in the columns. Now this means that looking at these two, we know the one will either be here and here or here and here. So we've got an X wing on ones here. Now that means there can't be any ones in any of those squares, the yellow squares. Now you can see I've got a 1, 9 penciled in this square. This cannot be a 1. Now let's just prove it to ourselves for the sake of good order. If I put a 1 here, what happens? You can see immediately I have to put a 1 here in column 4 and a 1 here in column 8. And that is why um, this square cannot contain a 1. So this is a 9 which means that this is a 1, and that's going to allow us to make a bit more quick progress anyway. Now this must be a 9 at the top. This is a 6, this is a 4. Now this should be, uh, what's that going to be? 4 as well, I think. Um, come down here. What number are we missing up here? We're missing threes and nines into these two squares. 
so let's pencil mark those in well we could use uniqueness here as well look this square looking at the this this row it's all getting a bit multicolored but a one four one four and a one four here so this square if we look at this square there's no way this can contain a one or a four because of uniqueness if I put a one or a four in this square the implication is that the puzzle has two solutions because there's no way of knowing whether um, when we look at the finished solution and there was a 1 or a 4 in this square there's no way of knowing why there was a 1 or a 4 in this square because these four squares would sit outside the rest of the puzzle and you could switch their parity over you could make this a 1 or a 4, this a 1 or a 4, this a 1 or a 4 and this a 1 or a 4 and the only thing that changes are these four squares these four squares do not influence any other part of the puzzle so that's why we know actually there is not a 1 or a 4 in this square and I could use that to crack this at this point but uh, I've seen that too there so let's let's carry on without uniqueness and see if we can actually uh, do it fairly quickly without that um, as I say if I was trying to solve this at speed I would certainly be using that technique uh, this is a 1 or a 9 here one six nine. So this is a six or a nine. That can be anything. Maybe in the interest of keeping the video down to a sensible length, I should I should be using my. Oh look, we can do another trick with the threes though. Let's do that. Um, threes into these two squares. This is a beautiful puzzle, by the way. Now look, that marries up with the threes here again. And so this. You know, this is why this pencil mark method is so powerful. This square can no longer be a 3. If it is, we get a 3 here and a 3 here. So this square is a 9. This square is a 3. Uh, the 9 here presumably is going to be a little bit useful. It's going to allow me to pencil mark lines into those two squares. Down here, the 9 must be in one of these two squares. And therefore, is that going to be enough? This is pointing at this square. So unsurprisingly, we find, because this is a good Sudoku, this square here cannot be a 1 or a 4. It's forced to be a 9. 1. Unwind the X-Wing. That's going to be a 4 now. Um, this is going to be a 4, 9, 1. This must be a 9, 6 here, 6 here, it's a 4 isn't it, I think, 4, 3, 3, 1, check. Fascinating puzzle, I think I made a bit of a meal of the finish, but there was a lot of nice logic at the start, the X-Wing was nice, the 5-8 pair was nice, I don't know whether I needed the X-Wing on 9s, but I thought it was nice too, and there was a whole load of stuff that emphasize the pencil mark. So I hope that was helpful to your solving. Do let us know in the comments if you enjoyed the puzzle and um, yeah we'll see you next time on Cracking the Cryptic.